Welcome to KJV Cafe, where the truths of God's Word come alive. Grab a hot cup of coffee or tea and spend some time learning about our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Listen now to Pastor Clark Covington of Heartland Community Baptist Church as he explores great insights from the Word of God. Are you aware there's a battle in your state? in your county, in your town, that there's a battle going on? Are you aware of that? There's a battle. Matter of fact, you are part of the battle. You are deeply involved in the battle, whether you know it or not. And it's a battle for the family. You know, we have a a war raging. Each day it's getting more and more intense. The stakes are as high as they've ever been. And the war is being fought over family, over your family. Think about it. The family is an institution of God created when he created man and woman and symbolic of his relationship with us. The battleground for this war we're talking about here today is the school, the schoolhouse. There is a battle going on for your family and it's happening at the schoolhouse. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 9 Thou shalt not sow thy vineyard with diverse seeds, lest the fruit of thy seed which thou hast sown and the fruit of thy vineyard be defiled. Thou shalt not sow thy vineyard with diverse seeds, lest the fruit of thy seed which thou hast sown and the fruit of thy vineyard be defiled. Wow. That's what we're talking about here today. You know, our children, young folks, they're in school, they're learning. They are um, a literally our seed. They are their next generation, and they are being put into a diverse uh, situation that is teaching them a wrong doctrine, teaching them falsehoods, uh, m- making them into worldly creatures without them even knowing it, developing a hatred for God, developing a doubt for God, removing the fear of God, and it's happening right under our noses in the schoolhouse. There's a battle. And that's what I want to talk to you about here for a little bit today is the problem with diverse seeds. You know, diverse seeds, they lead to a mixed crop. That's pretty uh, explanatory, right? If you had different kinds of seeds and you planted them and you water them, they're going to grow differently because they're different seeds. And there's going to be a crop that is at least partially compromised, right? And all throughout the Old Testament, the Lord is instructing the Israelites to stay pure, to stay holy, to not serve false gods, to not bow down to false idols, to not compromise themselves, to not intermarry with other groups, and all of these things that deals with compromise. And where we see it today, we may not see it uh, so much in in uh, plain um, sight like the Israelites would, where they would be off with a, a Jebusite or a Hittite, or they would be at uh, this false god's idol on the hilltop or whatever. We may not see it like that, but we're seeing it in the schoolhouse with diverse teachings that are far off from the ways of God. In fact, they're the antithesis of God. And it's a very well-oiled machine, and it's all powered by Satan and his army of devils. And the entire goal is to get young people afar off from God. And the entire goal, I would go further, is to break the family, to break the family. You think about this. Just think about this for a minute. Schools today, they're supposed to do what? Educate right? Which would mean make things clear and give understanding. But what do schools today do? They confuse children. They absolutely confuse children. If you have a child from a godly household that has been raised up and reared up in the ways of the Lord and you send them off to a public school, they will leave absolutely confused. I mean, think about this. We used to have school-sponsored prayer. And the school would allow praying over the loudspeaker, allow the teachers to pray. You know, we'd stand up, say the Pledge of Allegiance, say a prayer. Then the Supreme Court, according to uh, the Freedom Forum Institute, the Supreme Court made clear that prayers organized or sponsored by a public school, even when delivered by a student, violate the First Amendment, whether in a classroom, over the public address system, at a graduation exercise, or even at a high school football game. 
So the idea is that it's still legal for us to pray in school if we are, you know, if we're kids, but the teacher can't pray and you can't have school sponsored prayer. You can't have the coach praying. This all roots from uh, a June 25th, 1962 ruling. The Supreme Court declared school sponsored prayers unconstitutional in the case Engel versus Vitale. Well, since 1962 on, you're taking prayer out of school. And you're saying that we are neutral, but you're not neutral, because if they know anything of the Bible, in fact, before 62, they were praying uh, the Bible, so they should know the Bible. And the Bible says, I am your God, I am the one God, I am the true God, thou shalt have no other gods but me, and on and on and on. We serve a jealous God, amen. They know our God is the God, the creator of, of heaven and earth, they know that. But sin prevailed, the Supreme Court uh, the intellectuals of our society removed school-sponsored prayer, and now students are learning that prayer is not important, that prayer is not fundamental. Uh, I, I guarantee you that if a teacher walked into a classroom, I guarantee this, and said, okay, I want to lead everybody in some yoga, which is some wicked, adulterous, spiritually adulterous pagan religion, that whole class could do yoga all day long. And that school, that teacher would probably get teacher of the year award or something. But if you go in there and say, let's pray and let's pray because prayer makes a difference, you get fired, you get arrested, you get sued. So it's a confusion. And yet God is hundred percent holy and he cannot accept sin in his program. And so we have a, a con conflict here. God is saying, raise your ch children holy right? God is teaching us to raise our children in the way that, that uh, they shall go through his word and they shall not depart. So we are commanded to do that as Christians. And then the schools are corrupting it and making it impossible to do. Uh, think about sexual education. Parents Magazine cites that some states, including Florida and Alabama, have programs which stress abstinence first. Well, amen. That's a good idea, isn't it? To teach the kids not to have sex at that age. Don't you think that'd be a good idea? But then get this, many experts, according to Parents Magazine, believe it is ineffective and even potentially harmful. Erica Smith, uh, M. Ed D., so that'd be uh, Master's of Education, sexuality educator and consultant from Philadelphia, says keeping information for, about sex from young people teaches them their bodies and sex are shameful. You know, I just got done uh, working with our church, looking at uh, shame and when shame came about in the garden of Eden there with Adam and Eve. Once they had eaten the forbidden fruit, then they were shamed and they knew they were naked, right? And here we have this idea of shame and how it roots to sin. And here we have uh, Dr. Smith here, or excuse me, Master Degree Smith here, uh, telling us that if you keep this information from young people, it teaches them that their bodies and sex are shameful. So we have the perversion of shame. We have the true reason of shame, which is sin, which roots from the Garden of Eden, the sin curse. And then we have man's concoction, this, this perversion, which says, no, 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 it's actually shameful to not know about these lustful acts. Well, how about from the National Conference of State Legislatures? I'm sure you're reading their newsletter every week, but uh, how about from them? All states are somehow involved in sex education for public school ch children. Uh, I'll just read some statistics here. As of October 1st of 2020, 30 states and the District of Columbia require public schools to teach sex education, 28 of them which mandate both sex education and HIV education, 39 states and uh, Washington, D.C. require students to receive instruction about HIV. 22 states require that if provided uh, sex and or HIV education, they must be medically, factually, or technically accurate. State de uh, definitions of medically accurate vary from requiring that the Department of Health review the curriculum for accuracy to mandating that the curriculum be based on information from published authorities upon which medical professionals, not the Bible, nothing like that, not not uh, parents, not, sent, not people looking at the content, but medical professionals professionals uh, rely uh, as, as a relay as professional. You know, um, it really goes on and on here, these statistics. But, you know, only five states require parental consent before a child can receive instruction. You know, I'll be honest, uh, our son, I think, believe it was last year, got looped in on the first day of school to a sexual education course, and he was embarrassed, and he was, and he was ashamed. He came home and said, I didn't know what these words meant. 
Well, there's a reason why he didn't know what those words meant. He was raised in a Christian household, amen. We're not looking for him to get a head start on, on all of these problems. We're looking to keep him pure and holy. We're teaching him abstinence. We're teaching him to wait till marriage. We're teaching him what the Bible teaches. You know what the Bible says about fornication? It's a great sin. Oh my. And yet he was taught this on the first day of school. I believe it was last year. This is sad. This is really sad. I called the principal. I told the principal. I said, I'm very disappointed. The principal told me, I am too. He said, we got tricked. Someone said they were going to come in, that they had already signed the forms or whatever it was, and they hadn't. I say the first day of school. Let me say, let me correct myself and say the first week of school. I don't know if it was the first day, but I believe it was the first week. And the principal was upset. He apologized. I accepted his apology. I also said to myself, I'm not putting my other kids through this, amen, but this is not about me. This is about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You have all of this garbage. They take the prayer out and people say, oh, you can still pray, but it's not school sponsored. You really can't, especially corporately. You can't as a group. They're removing God from his throne in school. Then they're saying, let's teach them sex ed. Let's teach teach them not to be ashamed of their bodies. Let's teach them how to use contraceptives. Let's teach them and teach them and teach them. We, which is absolute insanity, because if you are giving this instruction or giving contraceptives, what you're saying is we approve. It's OK. You know, it's just like saying, here's a bottle opener if you want to open a beer. Well, what you're effectively saying is it's OK. And they do this. The schools do this. Why? Why? They view it their their obligation to to corrupt these children. They do it because it's the devil's playbook. So you get, you get all of this garbage, prayer removed, sex education, and then this one's a, a growing one we're seeing now. The children are now forced, are about to be forced to get taught, depending on what state they're in, critical race theory. What is critical race theory? Man, I've got paragraphs and reams on it, and I've read it and read it. I'm not sure I fully understand it. But it's a, apparently a recognition that race is not biologically real, but is socially constructed and socially significant. It recognizes that science, as demonstrated in the Human Genome Project, refutes the idea of biological race, racial indifferences, racial differences. Well, we, again, uh, Bible-believing Christians have said we all, all have fallen short, and we're all sinners, et cetera, et cetera. But go on, they had to get a scientific reason for it. Acknowledgement that racism is a normal feature of society and is embedded within systems and institutions. So they are forcing children to acknowledge this. You know, there are places that are not racist. Uh, They're forcing children to accept this. Uh, I'm in a, uh, my wife is Asian, I'm Caucasian. So I guess we're in a uh, uh, multiracial family. Uh, We don't feel like we're experiencing any kind of racial persecution. Our church, we've got people in there from uh, Honduras and Mexico and here in America and everywhere in between, I guess. If you look at little mini United Nations, uh, and we are a small congregation, of course, but we're diverse, and now you got a young child coming in there saying, okay, this institution is racist because critical race theory taught me this. And they have to learn it at school. I mean, this is what's on the ballot right now, I believe, with the Equality Act. Uh, it's what's being forced in the government institutions. If you want to work in the government, you want to work in a national park, you must first realize that you're a racist, apparently. So you have this recognition of the relevance of people's everyday lives, to scholarship. This includes embracing the lived experiences of people of color, including those preserved through storytelling and rejecting uh, deficit-informed research that excludes the uh, epistemologies of people of color. Oh my goodness, a lot of uh, big words here. But what does it mean? From Time Magazine, Time Magazine calls it an intellectual movement, that critical race theory is an intellectual movement. Critical race theory ultimately is calling for a society that is egalitarian, a society that is just and a society that is inclusive. And in order to get there, we have to name the barriers to achieving a society that is inclusive. This is Priscilla Osen, a uh, professor. Our government at the moment is essentially afraid of addressing our history of inequality. And they're saying if we can't address it, then we can't change it. So ironically here, you have this big intellectual, intellectual hubbubaloo that's saying Nothing that's saying that we all uh, should be equal, you know, and, and again, that's the big idea is if everybody is equal, then nothing stands out, right? So it's not that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior or our God is the one true God. It's no, 
that's just one of the many gods. It's this coexist theory. It's this new age theory. It's a very dangerous theory. Again, go, nothing, the Bible says nothing is new under the sun. And I agree with that. Go back to Greek and Roman times, and they had a God for everything, right? And they had the God of the sun and the moon and the stars and the fire and the earth and this and that and every other thing under the sun. And they didn't, you know, they, I guess they were hedging their bets. They didn't know which God was the, the one they'd have to deal with in the afterlife, or they thought they all were, right? And so they were trying to appeal to all these different gods. And that's what we have today in the schoolhouse, is man trying to appeal to all these different gods. And there's a great sermon that Paul preaches about the unnamed God uh, there to these intellectuals saying, I know who it is, and it's Jesus Christ, and it is your maker. Amen. Look, we need to get rid of this garbage. We were founded on Christian values, and everybody wants to, you know, debate that. But the truth is, read about the pilgrims, read about the Reformation, read about why they came over here for religious freedom, read about Bible-believing people going to a new land for freedom. We are the land of freedom, and we are being forced to eat this garbage in our schools. And and how are the schools funded? Taxpayer money. Okay, well, how about evolution versus creationism? I'm, I'm not going to go on forever, but you get this idea that it just goes on. How about in Michigan? In October 2006, the Michigan Board of Education voted unanimously to pass a new state science standards that ensure the teaching of evolution, but not the teaching of intelligent design or creation science. Michigan essentially voted to outlaw any any other belief other than the false belief of as evolution. And it is a belief, it's not a science. Someone says billions of years ago, here's my first question, were you there billions of years ago? Were you there? I'm sorry, were you there? I wasn't there, were you there? No, you weren't there. And again, as far back as time goes, people look like they do now, but oh, apparently we were once frogs. Language that some educators had argued cast doubt on the theory of evolution was removed from the final version of the guidelines. The new standards require public school students to be able to explain how a new species or variety originates through the evolutionary process of natural selection. It requires it. So if you don't believe this junk and you're in the state of Michigan, you're out of luck because you are required to pretend that you believe it talking about the fossil record and comparative anatomy and other evidence that supports the theory of evolution. I encourage anyone listening, check out Answers in Genesis. Check out uh, the movie on YouTube, Is Genesis History? There's great resources. There's brilliant scientists that ha provide a very factual, science-based argument based completely on the Bible that backs up the Bible account. But in Michigan, that may not matter. Now, in Alabama, I'm happy to report that Alabama's Board of Education voted to place stickers on public school biology textbooks and instructing high school students that evolution was a controversial theory and that any statement about life's origins should be considered as theory and not fact. And I guess they've gone back and forth over the years about this, but those stickers, I believe, are still there. From what I read, that's from um, Pew uh, Research Center. And so... What we see here is you have so much going on. And what what are we going to do as parents? Are we going to allow the devil to indoctrinate our kids with this garbage? And, you know, think about when when the mind is so um, uh, able to learn and so uh, takes everything foundationally for the rest of their life and all of these things is, is so, I, I use the word, just sensitive to learning or or open to learning or apt to learn and, and, and just ready to learn and just like a sponge. When is the mind like that? In your youth. That's when you develop, uh, you know, lifelong habits and traits and ideas and, and core values. And I mean, I'm speaking in defense of the Christian home. Can you imagine the lost person's home? I mean, and then this child is going to school and learning all this. And then we wonder why it's so hard these days to win souls. Why, why the harvest uh, seems to have some diverse seeds popping up where we can't seem to win souls anymore. We can't seem to get people to understand that God is who he says he is. And we lose that fear of God, which the Bible tells us correctly is the beginning of all wisdom to fear God out of Proverbs there. So what does it all wrap up to? We're not encouraged to pray in school. We take God off the throne. We are to hide from that and see our teachers living worldly, essentially, but then they say they're neutral. Then we are told God didn't make earth. It was a blob from a bang. Then we were told that blob turned into monkeys, which turned into sophisticated minds. 
minds that can have sex whenever they want without shame, but they should be ashamed because they've made society unfair and that everybody could fix everything if just admit their own racism and make everything equal for all. No matter what kind of perversion there is, everything is equal. And we're told it's okay to change gender or have no gender. You see how the author of confusion works? The Bible calls the devil the author of confusion. This is such a clever plot. You know, it strips out all these biblical values and it perverts all of them and creates um, a, a underpinning in young minds that are that is 100% antagonistic or against the Bible. If you ever wonder if the devil's behind it, say, well, what, you know, what is, if you took everything that's being taught in the schools and you flip it around, it leads to the Bible. You say, well, why is that? Why is the Bible so in conflict with public education today? Again, if it was just man being dumb, then why is it that the Bible is the one that's getting thrown out and being rejected and, and all of these things? There's a very good reason why. It's because the devil does not want the family in the Bible, does not want young minds in the Bible. Because if young minds are in the Bible, they won't need that sex ed, amen. They will stay in God's word and they will will take that to heart when the Bible says that fornication is a sin, when the Bible says to keep yourself pure, when the Bible gives you instruction for life. They'll take it to mind. You know, the vineyard is the mind and the grow house is the schoolhouse. The devil knows your kids often spend more time at school with their teachers than they do with their parents especially if you're living in a household with a single parent. Uh, They're spending more time at school than they are with that parent that they're not living with if they're not rotating uh, day to day, right? And then a lot of times their parents are busy with work, maybe working second or third shift, or maybe the child comes home and they've been at school all day, they're tired, what do they do to relax? Hop online, play some video games, watch some Netflix or whatever else, what, what's loaded on all of those things, more of the devil's handiwork, more temptation to sin, more angst towards Christianity, more uh, a leading astray. You know, it's really a miracle and it's really an act of God that any of us are ever able to be saved because when you see how society has set itself up, they have just pushed God so far away. Where is the world on display the most for young Christian minds? At school. And I was speaking to the Christian as well here, not just lost children. If Christian, if kids are not prepared to combat this, they'll fall victim to it. You know, I went to public schools in the Northeast growing up from four years old at preschool to 18, a very well-regarded school uh, outside of New York City. And then I went to a secular university for four years, small liberal arts college. They they said that they're affiliated with... Uh, a denomination, but truly they, they weren't, they didn't really push any kind of uh, biblical doctrine that I could see other than the doctrine of just, uh, I don't know, I won't get into that, but it was not, it was not a traditional Christian school. And then two years at a state school in, uh, in South Carolina, I saw, I had, gosh, a lot of secular education and so much of my time in the church, in the independent fundamental Baptist church over the last uh, decade or so has been kind of unwinding all of this that I've been taught, almost kind of like trying to not like distance my biases and my understandings from what I've been taught, taught because they've been so deeply rooted in my mind. And, you know, I'm just a simple guy, so I can't imagine many people, what they have to deal with, God forbid, you know, and that is a battle that we have with our own, you know, kids in our, in our, in our church and in society, uh, in, in the house, is trying to teach them, okay, well, what did you learn at school? Okay, well, it sounds like math was okay, and it sounds like, uh, uh, you know, whatever else was okay, English maybe, depending on what the book is. But no, uh, with science, we're going to have to undo some of this. We have to unteach some of this. We have to tell you the truth and show you, okay, they told you, oh, it must be real because of this carbon dating. Well, let's look at carbon dating. Or it must be real because so-and-so textbook. Well, let's look at the underpinning of this textbook, right? And we go through it and understand, again, just going back to the Garden of Eden, understanding where shame rooted from, understanding where sin rooted from, understanding who is the God of our lives, who is the sovereign God and leader of our lives. When we start understanding these biblical principles, we realize how corrupt the schools are. All right, so moving on here, kind of to wrap it up. Uh, I, I told you here first, 
that, you know, the school is corrupt in every way. The public school is corrupt. It is broken. It is a far off from God, no matter what anyone says. Secondly, I've told you the vineyard is the mind and the grow house is the schoolhouse. So the vineyard is where our kids, where the seeds are planted in our kids' minds, and those minds are being developed at school. And finally, the fruit of righteousness is never defiled. You know, uh, in our text verse here from Deuteronomy, it mentions uh, in Deuteronomy 22, 9, thou shalt not sow thy vineyard with diverse seeds, lest the fruit of thy seed which thou hast sown and the fruit of thy vineyard be defiled, right? Defiled. Defiled means to be unpure, right? Defiled means to meet some kind of uh, toxin or condition that is, that is rooted in making something bad or not pure, not holy, and what we see here, the fruit of righteousness is never defiled. God expects us to give our kids a unified upbringing in Christ, not watered down and not confusing. Look, I understand. I grew up in a single parent household. I understand uh, if you can't homeschool your kids, you can't send them to a Christian school. And again, with that Christian school, I would ask a lot of questions there too, uh, but that's for another day. But I understand that. And at the same time, God expects, and God understands that. I believe he knows the context of every single person's life. He created you. He's interested in the details. And yet he expects us to give our kids a unified upbringing in Christ, not watered down, not confusing. That means parents, we need to step up to the plate and ask a lot of questions and give a lot of time to these kids and love to these kids and word of God, scripture to these kids. You're listening to KJV Cafe. As you learn the great truths in God's word, we encourage you to take the verses mentioned in this episode and study them. Trusting God will open your eyes to a deeper understanding of Himself. Now here's Pastor Clark with the rest of today's message. Our, the renewing of our mind comes from the Word of God. Amen. Christ is our example. He was sinless and selfless. So why do parents put up with school, Christian parents, parents that believe in a Bible doctrine, why do they put up with it? I would say maybe they're busy, maybe they want a break, maybe they don't know what to do, don't have the other alternatives. We look at Christ as our example there. He was selfless and he was sinless, and he suffered uh, obedience unto death, right? Burial and resurrection to live out God's way for hum humanity, for mankind, and we must do the same. We must be like Christ. And so you know what? Even though we're tired from work or we're tired from this problem or that problem or whatever life throws our way, we need to put it to the side and say, son, daughter, sit down. Let me tell you about the commandments. Let me spend some time talking about Jesus. Let's look at what God would say about this lesson. Let's look at what God created. Let's look at, and there's so many great uh, resources on YouTube and on the internet to help share with your kids a godly perspective. And if you do that as the parent, I believe God will honor your effort and will convict those children. God's love for us shows us the right way, and he loves us enough to hear our prayers and deliver us from the evil in the schools today. The biggest mistake Christians can make is to think they're alone in this. You know, the battle, the battleground is the school. The battle is raging because it is just getting more and more awful as just that little bit of research I shared shows. Imagine someone hearing this sermon 30 years ago, they'd fall out of their seats at what's happening now. And 30 years from now, if the Lord tarries, it's going to be even worse uh, unless we start to pray and we pray and pray. And we, we activate our political efforts. We get with our legislators, but most importantly, we pray and we ask God to help us. We ask God to heal our land. We ask God to come back to the school. We get some bold Christians into the schoolhouse. We get some bold leaders in there to, to pray and to testify. And because again, it's the law right now, they're still allowed to pray. The kids are. And so Get them to pray. Get them to bring their Bible to school. Get them to get fired up about it. Get them to reject all of these things. Get them to walk out of that sex education class and say, I'm not participating in this. Give some conviction to your kids and give them permission to live for God wholly and truly until he returns. That's what I believe his will is for us, to live for him boldly. And like I said, our God is a strong God and a powerful God, and he will honor our work that we put in for him, we're not called to be lazy. Our work that we put in for him, he will honor it and he will bless. Thank you for your time and be praying that we win this battle at the schoolhouse through the grace and glory of God. Thanks for visiting the cafe today. 
Our goal is to inspire you with the truth and depth of God's Word in a straightforward manner. Do you know Jesus? You can today. Visit kjvcafe.com to learn more about God's great plan of salvation for all of mankind. Until next time, remember, as Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 puts it, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Righteousness.